Uh, today, I want to continue our series that we began last week called Rise Up. And last week, we talked about how the term rise up um, in Scripture is usually mentioned when there is a challenge or an adversity that is before us. And there is no adversity or challenge that is greater than being a parent. And uh, so let's look today at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, as we look at the topic, rise, mama, rise. Rise, mama, rise. Now, I realize not everybody in this room is a woman. And I do realize that not everybody here is a mom. But God might want you to encourage a mom. And uh, you never know, you might become a mom at some point in the future. Amen? It's possible. You never know. You never know. And I had a really unusual moment. This week, I woke up, I was thinking about Deuteronomy chapter 6, the, the passage I was going to preach to you today, and I began to think about Forrest Gump. Now, I don't know how I got Forrest Gump from Deuteronomy chapter 6, but I thought, run, Forrest, run. Run, Forrest, run. Can everybody just say that? Run, Forrest, run. And I thought, you know what? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible's saying, rise, mama, rise. Do you get it? Rise, mama, rise. So here we go today. Rise, mama, rise. Rise, mama, rise. We need moms. We need families. We need the home, don't we? Uh, experts tell us that we need moms more than ever. Three-fourths of teen suicides come from homes with absentee parents. 80% of adolescents in psychiatric hospitals come from broken families and kids who don't have a solid family and home situation are far more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, anxiety and depression, lack of confidence, uncertainty are, are symptoms that come from a home that is not intact. And that's why we need moms and dads. That's why we need godly, godly mothers to influence and to direct our families in the future. Um, both play such an important role. But let's talk today about this great passage because in the sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, the iconic leader, is challenging a new generation of people that are going to inherit the land of promise. Now, if you push the rewind button and you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, the Israelites had spent more than 400 years in Egyptian captivity. They were slaves. And God raised up a man by the name of Moses to go and to liberate the people. He brought the ten plagues. He brought the parting of the Red Sea. <clears throat> Moses was an amazing leader and God used him tremendously. So now the Israelites go to the edge of the promised land many miles away, and they don't believe they can take it. So God says, you know what, because you don't have faith, you guys are going to wander 40 years in the desert. An entire adult generation dies wandering in circles in the middle of nowhere. And now Moses is addressing a new generation. This is the second generation. These were the guys that like, they were little bitty babies maybe when Moses parted the Red Sea. They really didn't remember all of the plagues. They didn't remember the slavery. They, they just didn't remember all the stuff. And Moses' final words to them as their leader is to look back and to see what God has done and to pass on to subsequent generations the great work of the Lord. So with all that in mind, let's look at Genesis, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Um, he says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these commandments that I give to you today will be on your hearts. And, and he begins to instruct them about the raising of children. The first thing he says is, love, mama, love. Love, mama, love. In other words, the, the, the most important thing that a parent can do is to show their great love for the Lord. And he challenges the hearers to set an example and atone in the family by loving the Lord, by loving the Lord. He says, listen, Israel, 
the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your mind. And he says, these commandments I give to you today that they could be on your hearts. And then in Deuteronomy eleven eighteen, he echoes something similar. He says, impress them on your children. That is the commandments of Moses. And talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And that word impress is also a word that can be translated engrave or inscribe or even cut. You know, Moses is saying, listen, you need to love the Lord so much that it makes an impression on your kids that they can never get away from. That They, they cannot forget it. They, they cannot overlook it. You got to engrave it on their hearts. You got to impress it on their hearts. That, that, that's the goal of every Christian parent is to impress something on the heart of their kids in, in and through the word of God that, that is with them for a lifetime. In other words, it's not writing with a dry erase marker. It's engraving with a chisel and with a hammer. Amen. That's what we want to do, right? We want to leave a mark on the life of our kids that is something that will be with them forever. And that is to love God and to love his commands. Uh, we ought to do that. Our parents will be, our kids will be not just what we say, but our kids will be what we model for them. And this passage here in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 is what is called the Shema. Everybody say Shema. Shema, Shema is a Hebrew term and it means this little statement, it references this little statement, the Lord is one, the Lord, the Lord our God uh, is one. And little Hebrew babies are taught this from the moment that they can first speak. I mean, can you just imagine that? That's how important that this text of scripture is to, to, to the Hebrew people, to devout Hebrews. I mean, they start saying dada and gaga and it's the Lord is one. <laughs> you know, if you can just get that in your mind. And uh, Jewish people recite this over and over. A devout Jew will say this in the morning and in the evening. And kids are taught to say this. The Lord is one because the Israelites didn't want to have any other gods that were before the great God, the real God. And so this is why this statement is referred to over and over again. Now, isn't it interesting that the people are commanded to love God. Does that sound odd to anybody? Like, how can you, how can you say, love the Lord your God? How can you make somebody love somebody? Does that sound a little odd? Yeah, I think it does. A lot of times we associate love with an emotion or a feeling or, you know, like a little quiver in our liver. I fell in love, you know? Have you ever said that before? I just fell in love. Like the statement is like, I was just walking along and I just stumbled off the stage. I fell in love, you know. Woo, I fell in love. But you know, many of you know that love is more than a feeling. Love is a commitment. Love is a commitment that you make. And if you will make the commitment of love, the feeling of love will come behind it. Amen. And that's when he says, love the Lord your God. He's talking about making a commitment to something. And when you make the commitment, the feelings will follow. How many of you that are married, how many married people today have ever loved your spouse, but also wanted to kill them? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, right. <clears throat> and it wasn't that you didn't love them. It's because you did love them that you wanted to strangle them. Right. So love is a commitment. You can be frustrated with your children and still love them. Right. So when he says love the Lord, your God, he's talking about making a commitment. I'm in it for the long haul. I will love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, soul and strength. In other words, like all of our being, like all we got, the heart, the emotion, the mind, the intellect, the soul, the will, <clears throat> all that I've got. I want to love the Lord. Parents, kids need to see parents who love the Lord. That's what they need to see more than any, not this phony stuff, not just I went to church on Mother's Day weekend and, you know, I said amen, hallelujah, and put a little change in the offering. None of that. I'm talking about the real deal. Parents who deeply, 
passionately love the Lord. Really love the Lord. We should love mama, love. And when I lead somebody to the Lord, when I have an opportunity to do that, I always go and talk to my kids about it. I want to engrave on their heart a passion to reach people. I want to leave a mark on them. Sometimes my kids and I will pray for people to know the Lord. We'll pray for some of, we're praying for some of our family members to know the Lord, you know, and we'll get together and we'll pray. Sometimes I'll share the gospel, the good news in front of my kids. And I want them, the hearer to understand what I'm saying, but I also want my kids to, to watch what I'm doing. Cause one day I want them to share the good news with somebody. Amen. Yeah. When we have special offerings here at the church, I always go to my kids and I'm like, all right, man, what do you want to do? You know, and uh, my kids bring tithes on their allowance. They they have an opportunity to give offerings above that if they choose to do that when they want to do that. That's encouraged, but it's not forced. We're having a special offering at church. What do you want to do this year? You know what's going on, you know, and and I'm writing it on their heart the best that I can best that I can. Let's write it on the heart of those kids. Let's do it. Let's do it. Inviting other people to church man, write it on their hearts. My kids have seen me invite so many kids to church. I'm like, Zane, where are your cards? You know, and he's like, dad, here they are. I'm like, come to church. You're going to love church. Come to church. Amen. Let's write it on our kids' hearts. Let's write it. Let's start early and let's stay with it. Um, the evangelical psychologist James Dobson says that by the sixth year, the major opportunity to impress the spiritual direction of a child has already passed. Can you believe that? Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities beyond six years old. But what it does mean is that the di spiritual direction of a kid's life will be profoundly impacted in those very early years. Parents, we got a challenge. Listen, we can't be sloppy and lazy. We need to be leading the way, helping our kids love and know Christ with all of our heart. And we ought to start early and we ought to stay with it because there's a lot of work to be done. A lot of work to be done. Love, mama, love. But we also got to teach, mama, teach. Okay, when you, it starts with love. But it continues with teaching. Look at this in Deuteronomy 6, 6, 6 through 9. Uh, These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your house and your gates. He says you got to teach the kids. Okay, you set the example by love, but you have to teach. How do, we, how do we teach our kids? Well, we teach them all the time. And this passage sounds so weird when it's talking about bind them on your hands and put them on your foreheads and all that. Did you know if you go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem or if you're around devout Jewish families, they still do this. Uh, and in ancient times they did it and they still do it today. They will bind a leather box to their left arm facing their heart with passages of scripture that have been written in it. And it in the, the leather straps tie around the hand. Maybe you've seen it before, the fingers and all that. They will also wear a similar box on the top of their head. You know, and it kind of goes around the chin, kind of like a football helmet, you know, <laughs> A little bit like the straps go around and they got the word of God. Now, it looks kind of strange, right? If you saw somebody on the street with a box on their head and on their arm, you'd be like, that's a little odd. But this was the Hebrew way of keeping the word of God close to their heart and at the forefront of their mind. Amen. And so here Moses is saying, guys, don't get away from the word. And he, he even builds on this and he says, put it on the doorpost of your, on the gates of the house. Put the word of God there everywhere you go. Devout Hebrews will have the scripture over their, the, the front door of the house. Oftentimes people will kiss their fingers and they will touch it as a showing sign of respect and, and reverence for the word of God. 
Now, we don't practice these things in, in that capacity in the 21st century and, and, and certainly in Christian circles. But listen, the word of God should always be close to our heart and it always should be on the tip of our brain. And it ought to be all over the home. Amen. Literally and figuratively. I mean, we need the word of God in the home. We need the word of God to be the focus of what we do. We need it to remind us, but we also need it to teach the children. Moses is saying, listen, it's not good enough for you guys to just talk about how much faith you have. You have to pass it on. Are you passing on your faith to the next generation, to your children? Are your kids going to love the Lord as much or more than you do? Have you set the stage for that to happen? We got to teach. We got to teach. And he says here, the teaching is not formal. It's not like, hey, little Johnny, come sit down on this desk and let me lecture you. You know, it's Bible time. Actually, the description that Moses gives to us is actually very informal. It's like when you lie down and when you get up and you walk down the street and, you know, when you're sipping some lemonade and when you're cooking dinner and on Saturday morning and on Thursday night and on Wednesday afternoon and, you know, before school and after school. And it's just like the normal traffic patterns, the rhythms of life are the great opportunity to talk about the things of God. It should be spontaneous. It should be, it should be uh, something that is not necessarily always provoked or planned, but it's something that happens, right? That doesn't mean we can't plan some conversations because we probably need to have some conversations. We know at certain stages we need to talk to kids about this and this and this. But, but it also ought to be a lifestyle, I think is what Moses is saying. Like, we should always be teaching. It's not like I checked the box. Oh, I had this talk with my kid and I told him this. And I, no, you, you're, ta- you're telling them the same thing over and over and over again. How many of you know that to be true as a parent, right? If you want to get your kids to do something, you don't tell them one time, right? I coach the fifth grade basketball team. You guys know that? I tell my kids, you know, 10 times to do something. It still doesn't happen. I was like, this is a lot like parenting, isn't it? (laughs) Repetition. Moses is saying you have to keep repeating it. And you say the same thing in a lot of different ways and a lot of different contexts when things come up. We were watching the news the other day and an issue came up that's facing our country, a social issue. And my kids were like, Dad, what's a blah, blah, blah? And I was like, well, let me tell you. And we just, I paused the TV and we just had a little five minute talk about this topic. And this is what we believe. And this is what the Bible says. This is what God thinks about that. Got it. You know, okay, awesome. You know, on to the next thing. And then, you know, I'm sure we'll continue to have other conversations about that topic and many others. And it was just one of those impromptu conversations. Also, these things cannot always be planned. I had a, a, a spiritual mentor of mine tell me when I was newly married, we had no children. And uh, he had teenagers. It was an older man in our church. And he said, Ryan, he said, when you're raising kids, and he said, especially teenagers, you, you cannot miss some of those moments to talk to kids about certain things. Because there's certain times when kids are open to talk about something. And if you're not paying attention or you're too busy, you'll miss that opportunity. And then you'll try and go back and have that conversation. And they'll be like, oh, no, Dad, I'm good. I don't want to talk about that. He said, so when the door opens, and it's always at an inconvenient time for the parents, right? It's always like when you're tired, when you don't want to talk about that, then, then it's like, boom, then it opens. But we have to, we have to seize the moments. We have to seize that time. Uh, we, 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 we gotta, we gotta not, we gotta realize it's not a, tw- it's not a break. I mean, we, it's a 24 seven deal when you're a Christian parent, you're, you're on all the time. Now, Jesus taught that God is not concerned with the external trappings of religion. What he wants is a true transformation of the heart. Uh, in, in the new Testament times, Jesus was confronting some of the religious leaders who would wear the scripture on their head and on their arm and went through all the religious motions. You know, people were trying to outdo people by having a big, b- bigger billboard on top of their head. You know, I'm more spiritual than he is and all that. But he said, listen, you can put all this stuff on your head, but if it did in your heart, it doesn't matter. Right? I want your heart, not just your signs. Okay? I don't want your boxes. I want your life. I want all of you. So don't just go through the motions of religiosity. 
Parents, let's use the time that we have to make a profound impact on our kids. Planned and unplanned conversations. Uh, do whatever it takes. And put the Word of God all over the place. Put it on your furniture. Put it on your, in your living room. Put it on your mirror when you're getting dress in the morning, write it there, put it on a post-it note, put it on your phone, put it on your screensaver, wherever you go, the word of God is everywhere. We got to also focus mama focus. So we're going to teach mama teach. We're going to love mama love. We're going to focus mama focus. Now look what Moses says right here in verse 13. Fear the Lord your God, worship him and take your oath in his name. Do not follow God's other gods, and the gods of the people around you. The people around the Israelites were polytheistic, meaning they believed in many gods. The Jews believed in how many gods? One God. One God. He says, don't be like everybody else. Everybody else has got a shrine. Everybody else has got an altar. Everybody else has got, you know, like a little statue. Don't be like all those guys. You be who I've called you to be, and that is a follower of the one true God. Don't, don't get confused. Don't get sucked into that. Don't, 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 you know, don't, don't, don't fall into that trap of worshiping many gods. Most people today in our nation are not bowing down to statues and icons, but we do worship at the altar of other, other things other than the Lord. Sometimes it's the worship of self. What do I want? And, and we can worship anything that becomes the priority in our life, right? So if the priority is me over the Lord, then I'm bowing down to the altar of self. My image, how do I look? What do I want to do? And so forth and so on. We can't worship there. We can't worship that, that image of what we so desire, the worship of self, the worship of stuff, is our possessions. You know, can I be content with less? Do I have to have certain things to feel good about my life? You know, back in the day when you bought things, you had to go to a store and they were only open between this hour and this hour and then you had to take it home with you. Today, you can shop 24-7. For some of us, that's dangerous, isn't it? I mean, you could shop all night long. I got to have more stuff. I got to have more stuff. Listen, stuff is great. Let's don't worship the stuff. Amen. Let's let, let, let's 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 develop a heart of generosity that protects us. That's what tithing is. Tithing is protection against getting sucked into the stuff because it's putting God first in our finances. That's God's desire for us. We could worship the stuff. We could worship success. I got to have this rank. I got to have this influence. I have to have uh, this value uh, to feel good. I could worship security. If I just had this much, I would feel good. But God wants us to worship the Savior. The Savior. And the Savior is who we worship. And we need to teach kids about the Savior. Now, when Moses says we should love the law of God, that sounds kind of boring. Why should I love the Ten Commandments? Why should I love that? Most people run from the Ten Commandments, right? Why should I love that? But the reason that God gave us the law and the commandments was to teach us that we need a Savior. Did you know that? Because we look at the teachings of the Old Testament and we look at the teachings of the New Testament and we look at that and we go, I am incapable of keeping the letter of the law. I cannot live a perfect life. Wow, I need help. I need to be redeemed. I need the Lord Jesus. I need a Savior. And so when we look at the law of God and the law of Moses, we see our own imperfections and we see our need for redemption. We see that we need Christ. So what do we do? Well, Mama, we got to answer. We got to answer these great questions. Because listen, if you're a mom, you're going to be asked questions. Why does the Bible say this? Why does God want that? What about this, that, and the other? Look at Deuteronomy 6.20. When your son asks you in the future, 
What is the meaning of the decrees and statutes and ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us up out of Egypt with a strong hand. Before our eyes, the Lord inflicted great and devastating signs and wonders on Egypt, on Pharaoh, and all of his household. But he brought us from there in order to lead us and to give us the land that he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to follow all these statutes and to fear the Lord our God for our prosperity, always for your preservation as it is for today." And then in verse 25, righteousness will be ours if we are careful to follow every one of these commands before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Now, a bunch of stuff in there, but check this out, man. Answer, mama, answer. So when your kids ask you questions, why do we keep the commandments? Why do we read the Sermon on the Mount? Why do we go to church all the time? Why does God say do this and not do that? He says, answer them with telling them the story of what God has done. He says, God brought you up out of Egypt. I got a question today. What has God brought you out of? What has God delivered you from? How has God transformed your heart and your life? Did, did you used to struggle with anxiety? And then you met the Lord. Share that with your kids. Did, did, did you used to... Did you used to struggle with despair and then you found joy? <laughs> did, did it used to be fear and now you have peace? Share your story. Moses is saying, listen, tie the answer to the redemptive purposes and the plan of God. What, what has God done in your life? We love to celebrate Mother's Day at the Heller household because we weren't sure we would ever be parents. We were on the long extended plan. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it took us like nine, 10 years to have Zane, first kid. And then we had the second kid back to back, Bryn, like it was like bang, bang, you know? Once the flip, the switch got flipped, it was like, oh my goodness, you know? And we were freaking out. We had two kids. We love Mother's Day because it just reminds us that God was with us, you know? Our kids know they're special because they know how difficult it was to even have the kids in the first place. And so why should I keep the commandments, mom? Why should I follow the, de the decrees and the ordinances of God? Because God has been faithful to us in the past. That's why. And he goes on and he says, listen, when you follow what God has said, you'll be blessed. He uses the word prosper. You'll prosper. If you want to prosper in life, do what God has said. You want to have a miserable, hard, difficult life? Do it all on your own initiative in your own way. That's the recipe for heartbreak and hardship. But you want to be blessed of God? Follow God's commands. Follow God's... Do, do it God's way. When you date somebody, do it God's way. When you manage your finances, do it God's way. Do what God said and you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. The Lord has commanded us to follow all these statutes and to fear the Lord our God for our prosperity and always for our preservation. In other words, like if you want to be preserved and prosperous, do what God has said. Do what he said. I love that. I love that so much. We've been teaching our kids, um, you know, over the last few years how to pray. A few years ago, our boy was a little bit younger and he lost the arm to his transformer. Oh, this was major meltdown. Has your kid ever had a toy that like, if it's not around, like, it's almost like, you know, the nuclear holocaust just happened. Like every, the world is coming to an end. All right, so the, uh, and it wasn't the whole transformer. I think it'd have been better if the whole transformer had disappeared. It was the arm of the transformer. And I was like, Gina, can I run to the store and buy this arm of the transformer? I don't know anything about transformers. She was like, no, they don't make it anymore. It's, it, you, can, you can't buy the arm anyway. And I'm like, could we just, could, could we get him, you know, like it was green. I was like, could we get him an orange one? She was like, no, he's smarter than that. You, you ain't going to get that by him. Gina's like, we need to pray. 
I'm like, all right. I was like, you can pray for transform our arms. She's like, yeah, we, we'll pray. <laughs> Zane, come here. Let's pray and ask God to help you find your transform arm. Lord Jesus, please give us the transform. You know, and Gina's like, Lord, you better come through on this one. <laughs> so they're praying. Zane's like, Mom, does prayer work? She's like, oh, yeah, prayer, prayer is awesome. Prayer works. Come on, Lord. You know, and she went back out and began digging around in the car where she thought it was. And you know what? She found the transformer arm. Now, I know this story sounds kind of silly that we pray for the transformer arms. But Gina wanted our kids to understand that if it matters to you, it matters to God. And even something as insignificant as a little piece of a toy can be important when we bring that to the Lord. I hope that the next time he loses something more valuable, that his, the thought that's been etched on his heart will be, I'm going to call on the Lord. I'm going to talk to the Lord. And the Bible says we'll prosper. Let's prosper. I want to see some families prosper. Amen. I want to see some teenagers prosper. I want to see some children prosper because they've been raised in a home and the word of God has been engraved on their heart. A few years ago, a few years ago, we had a single mom come to the church. She brought a, her second grade son. The second grade son was saying to the counselor at school, I want to die. The kids get in trouble. It's depressed all the time. The dad's not involved. The mom's doing the best she can. It's hard. She's like, I have no idea what to do. I'm going to church. So she starts showing up at church. A couple of months into their time, they're coming to church. They're coming every week, man. I mean, this mom's like, never been to church before. She's here every Sunday. God help my family. I don't even know what I'm doing, but do something. The kids ministry starts talking to the, to the boy. He gives his life to Christ one Sunday at church. Pretty awesome. It's like, mom, I need to get baptized. She's like, anything, <laughs> you know, please. You know, like, what, whenever, whatever. The boy gets baptized. A couple weeks later, the counselor calls the mom. She's like, hey, what's going on with your kid? She said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, he's not getting in any trouble. He doesn't want to kill himself. He, he's, he's like a normal kid. He's making good grades. He's turning in his assignment. He's just... He's just like what in the world happened? And it was in that moment that this mom realized it was the Lord. It was God that made a difference. She came to church the next Sunday and gave her heart to Christ as well. Is that amazing? She was like, if God can do that in his life, maybe God could do something in me too. Wow. It's awesome. And this mom, in the best way she knew how, I'm telling you, she didn't even know the Bible. She didn't know the Lord. All she knew is I'm going to do what God's put before me. I'm coming to church. Please help my son. And God started to do great things. I share that today as a word of encouragement to you today. Wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life, let's write the word of God on the hearts of your kids. And the scripture says, so that when they get old, that they will not depart from it. Amen. That's God's desire. Mama, let's rise. Rise, mama, rise. Teach, mama, teach. Love, mama, love. Focus, mama, focus. Let's do it. Let's do great things for God by building godly homes. Let's bow together for a word of prayer.